Good evening, everyone. This is Atlanta. Good evening, everyone. Wonderful. Welcome to Atlanta History Center. It's so wonderful to see all of you here tonight. And I know like all of you, I am so excited to be welcoming a true Atlanta legend um, in the room tonight, uh, John Pruitt, for his first book, his novel, Tell It True. I see many of you have your copy of the book already with you tonight, but if you have not yet purchased your copy, we have extra copies for sale out in the lobby where you're, you will be able to do that after the talk. They're 25% to off tonight only as a special thank you for being our guest tonight. Um, so if you'd like to grab an extra copy or haven't gotten yours yet, um, please grab a copy of John Pruitt's Tell It True. On behalf of Atlanta History Center, I'm Claire Haley. I'm our Vice President of uh, Democracy Initiatives and Author Programs. Our Author Talk series brings together authors from all around the country, but it's always really special to us when we get to host an Atlanta author like we do tonight. I'm sure John Pruitt needs very little introduction to the folks in this room tonight, but in case if you're new to Atlanta, John Pruitt is an absolutely legendary newsman here in Atlanta. He started working at WSB in 1964. His experiences really informed the book that you have in your hands tonight. He covered many monumentous events here in Georgia, all kinds of history from the civil rights movement to major political moments to all, everything in between, the Olympics, all of it happened during his tenure at WSB. Um, he started out just as you know, a newsman reporter and rose all the way up the ranks to be um, the anchor on the evening news that I know many of us uh, probably watched every night for many years. Uh, after his talk concludes tonight, John will be taking your questions. So if you have any questions, um, be sure to save those until the end. I'll be walking around with a microphone. And he will be signing and personalizing books after the event. If you pre-purchased your book, it should be pre-signed. Flip it over and double check. But if it's not, or if you'd like it personalized, he can take care of that for you after the event tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming tonight's featured author, John Pruitt. Well, thank you so much, Claire, and it's great to be at the History Center, certainly one of the premier stops on the Tell It True tour. I've been all over the state and beyond, and uh, this is one I'm particularly looking forward to because I know I'm talking to lovers of history. I happen to be one myself, and I was lucky enough not only to have grown up in Atlanta, but I got my first job in Atlanta at WSB Television and was able to actually cover history the history of my hometown, the town I love, on a daily basis for almost half a century. How lucky was I? Uh, so my book is, is about this history. Uh, it is fiction, but I think those of you who are familiar with the 60s in Georgia will find it to be authentic. At least that is my fond hope. What I've attempted to do and tell it true is capture a moment in time, a pivotal time for Georgia, and the South, Atlanta, a time when a great movement was underway, but the forces of resistance to that movement were fierce and sometimes violent. It was a time when the time-tested, nonviolent method of civil rights protest was at a point where there was rebellion in the ranks, or beginning rebellion in the ranks, when some members of the civil rights movement were feeling the nonviolence of this movement is over. It's time to be more confrontational, take more direct action. It was the beginning of what we later call the Black Power Movement. It was a time when very wise and pragmatic leaders in government, in business, in the black community and in the white community of Atlanta steered us through very perilous shoals of societal revolution. The, the prize would be, if they could get us through it, the prize would be a new South City, a progressive city that would welcome business, development, major league teams, culture. That would be the prize if it could be done. If it could not be done, then you only had to look at what happened in Birmingham in 1963. Civil rights protesters being washed down the streets by fire hoses, police dogs tearing at their clothing. These are images that last for generations. In fact, whoop. In fact, 
those images still may dance in your minds when you think of Birmingham, and I apologize to any Birmingham residents or people who have lived in Birmingham, but it's a fact of the matter. Those images were so negative and they lasted for so long, Atlanta was able to, to get through that time successfully. And the result you see is today, Atlanta, this thriving, booming metropolitan region. So these are the forces that were at play. And then you add to that the news media. Of course, there's, you know, I'm gonna write about the news media, I'm a reporter. I had asked Andy Young to do a blurb for this book. And he did more than that, a blurb, of course, a couple of sentences that goes on the, the cover of the hardbound edition. He wrote a whole page and my publishers at Mercer Press said, there's no way we can take two sentences out of this. We're gonna run it as an afterword to your novel. But in that very gracious afterward, Andy Young said, in his view, the men and women of the news media are the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. And I think he was absolutely correct. It was a time, this time that I'm writing about, which is 1964, the summer of 64 in Georgia. The news media was telling the civil rights story to the rest of the nation and the world. Television in particular was transmitting images of violence, of protest, of courage, of good things and bad things, but predominantly in those days, I hate to say it, but it's true. The news coverage was of violence, violent protest, violent resistance, murder, sometimes mayhem, horrible things being said, uh, it, was, it was a terrible time in many respects, but those images were transmitted on a nightly basis to television screens from Dubuque to Seattle, Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. People around the country and the world, in effect, watched the civil rights movement on their television sets. And let me not leave out the fine print journalists too, the Ralph McGills, the Eugene Pattersons, who were writing editorials and helping shepherd the city through those times. But it was television, television news, and the courageous people who went out to take that news film, sometimes at great personal risk, that was making a huge difference in terms of propelling the civil rights movement. Gains were made much more rapidly because people around the country were able to view it and react to it. So that is the time I was trying to capture. And I set up an alternative universe involving all of these forces. And then I look back and I said, well, how do I begin this story? And what better place to begin it than my first week on the job at WSB? A naive college kid, just graduated, history major, but no other credentials for covering news, no journalism courses. I had no knowledge of news film, almost no knowledge of journalism and how it worked. And yet, in that week, I learned so much. The 2nd of July, 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 64 was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. It was very apparent that this law was not going to be obeyed by an awful lot of people. Rebellion was in the air. And on July 4th of that week, two days later, my first week on the job, never having covered a story, I was assigned to assist a more senior reporter who knew what he was doing, carry his equipment to cover a segregationist rally at the old Lakewood Fairgrounds. There's a football stadium there, high school football stadium. And it was full of segregationists. And they had been stoked to fever pitch by the speakers of that day who were on a flatbed truck on a football field talking to a concrete tier football stadium. And into that rally came four young black kids, students, protesting the fact that they were protesting the fact that the Civil Rights Act had been signed into law. And the crowd went berserk. They set upon these young kids and started beating them uh, with fists and metal folding chairs. And the blood was flowing. And my senior reporter friend who had taken me along and I had helped him carry equipment because that was all I was qualified to do, handed me a silent camera and said, John, I know you've never shot film. Here's the button you push, you look through here, go see what you can do. I was able to get film of this horrible episode 
of these four young men, at the time I thought being beaten to death, as it turned out, they were rescued by police, but they were still gravely injured. And it was that night that that film went coast to coast on the uh, NBC Nightly News. First film I ever shot. It's a miracle it came out. It's a miracle it actually got transmitted to the, the country. But it was apparent from that experience that I had found a job I could truly love. And it was also appalling to have witnessed that. And it was not the first time I witnessed and recorded such scenes of violence and hatred. And it affected me. First week on the job. Second week on the job, July 11th, an African-American lieutenant colonel retired named Lemuel Penn was driving home to Washington, D.C. after two weeks of reserve training at Fort Benning. He was a World War II veteran. He served at the Pacific Theater. He had a Bronze Star. He was not a civil rights activist. He was a public school administrator in D.C. He had a wife and three kids, and he was driving back home in the dead of night because very often in the South in those days, there was not a place for a black person to stop to get a bite to eat. No motels would allow them to come in, despite the fact that the Civil Rights Act, the Public Accommodations Act, had been signed into law 11 days prior, or 10 days prior. Driving through Athens, Georgia, with Washington, D.C. license plates on his car, Klansmen, who were out and about driving and prowling the roads in the Athens area, spotted that car, spotted the license tag, followed the car, and on the Broad River Bridge in Madison County, the Madison-Elbert County line, they opened fire with shotguns and murdered Lemuel Penn. Uh, horrendous crime, huge national story. LBJ sent the FBI in, media from around the world came to Madison County, and it was a story that just kept developing. I wanted to use that story as a framework for my novel because I was writing fiction. I was not writing a clinical historical examination of the Lemuel Penn murder. But I wanted something that had historical authenticity and put it into a fictional milieu where I could have my own characters, create my own drama, create an alternative universe where I could be absolutely true to the times, true to the dialogue of the times, true to the characters and how they might react, but it had to be my story. People often ask me, well, you've spent a half a century writing news copy. My gosh, you were, you were telling it true every night. Why did you turn to fiction? It's a great question. I turned to fiction because it is entirely liberating to break away from you know, the, the vice grips of having to be accurate about everything, as I was in news copy, to tell a story. And I've told a fictional story, but it has elements of truth. It is based on truth. And let's face it, that's what historical fiction is, right? I mean, think James Mishner. Uh, think Herman Wouk, Winds of War. I mean, there's so many examples of it. Uh, so, and, and it's my true belief that good historical fiction, if it is authentic, if it tries to be true to the times and the characters, is a great learning experience. It can make history more accessible to the reader and hopefully encourage the reader to find out a little more about the time, about the actual events. And that's what I hope in the case of Lemuel Penn, because in my acknowledgments, even though my character, Jarvis Pendry, who was murdered in the first chapter, so it's not a plot spoiler, and there are many similarities between the actual murder of my character, Jarvis Pendry, to the one, the actual murder of Lemuel Penn. Uh, even though there are similarities there, there are many fictional differences. And that continues throughout the novel. So once you bridge that gap, it's not so bad. But for those who truly want to know more about the story, I refer them to a book written by my friend and a name that many of you will know, Bill Shipp the veteran honored journalist who wrote Murder at the Broad River Bridge, which is the actual story of the Lemuel Penn killing, killing, and I mentioned that in my acknowledgments. So I have a framework of a murder, 
an investigation into that murder, a sensational murder, uh, the trial, and the aftermath. So that is the superstructure of the novel. The crime, the investigation, the aftermath provide, provided the gravitational pull to bring these characters into my story. Uh, some of the characters will be familiar to you. You may think you know who they are. I don't think you will be accurate. Uh, they are composites. <laughs> they are composites of, of people I covered. And there are actually some people I covered in the audience tonight, but <laughs> so, and I can't wait for them to read the book and let me know. But I think it would be fun, you know, for people who know a little about Georgia history and political history in particular, civil rights history as well, to uh, read the book and try to figure out who I was thinking about when I wrote that part. But let me just give you an outline of a couple of the characters. Um, the civil rights uh, figures in the book, um, Elijah Pendry, the Reverend Elijah Pendry, is, I'm sorry, Elijah Timmons, is a pastor of a small Atlanta church. He has led nonviolent movements in Atlanta. He has debated and, and wrestled concessions from the Atlanta white power structure, been fairly successful. He would like to see his profile raised a bit. He sees the murder of Jarvis Pendry as a possible way to do that. But he has to deal with a young student at Morehouse named Marcus Turner, who thinks Timmons is an Uncle Tom. It's time to move beyond the nonviolent protest and take more direct action. We need progress by any means necessary, he says, quoting Malcolm X. So he is the conflict point within the, the movement, and he too sees the murder of Jarvis Pendry as a way to elevate his profile. The murder happens in a, in a fictional county in Georgia, northeast Georgia, called Pickett County. The actual murder was in Madison County, but not to be confused with Madison County, but it's Pickett County, named, you might suspect, for uh, General George Pickett, who led Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, uh, considered by many historians to be the high point of the Confederate cause in the Civil War. After that, it was pretty much downhill. And Pickett is not really a, a deified figure in, in uh, the minds of civil rights historians. But the county is named for Pickett. There's a statue of General, statue of General Pickett in the, in the square. The square is by the, the town, uh, uh, county seat, by the way, is Armistead, for those of you know, you know your Gettysburg history. Uh, the sheriff of Pickett County is <clears throat> Lucas McSwain. When you first meet him in the book, you might think he's a stereotypical, stereotypical uh, rural southern sheriff. A little overweight, a little swaggering, kind of bullyish. Uh, he runs his county like a fiefdom. And that is true, frankly, of, of many rural southern sheriffs. Uh, but he's, he's, he thinks. He's thoughtful. He's got World War II experience, too. He fought with Patton in World War II. And he's run his county like his own little domain. Whites are deferential to him. Blacks fear him. They feel he's a racist, and in fact, he is. But suddenly, Lucas McSwain is faced with a murder in his county that has nationwide implications. And suddenly, the FBI is coming in. The GBI is coming in. The New York Times is coming in. ABC, NBC, CBS are coming in. And he is overmatched. He doesn't know how he's going to handle all of these changes in Pickett County, not to mention the fact that the civil rights protesters are coming in. Lucas McSwain, one of the, the drama points in the book, one of the arcs, is following Lucas McSwain and how he deals with all this, and it might not turn out the way you think. I had to have a political aspect to this story. There's, there's one candidate for governor in here tonight. <laughs> Norman Underwood's here and uh, Buddy Darden, two people I covered back in the day who had great political experience. Thanks for coming, guys, and Lily. Uh, I needed a governor's race, but I had a big problem. There was no governor's race in 1964 in Georgia. <laughs> there was one in 62, Carl Sanders won that race. There was one in 66, Lester Maddox won that race, but there was no race in 64. So, Given the liberty of fiction, 
I created a governor's race in 1964. I know it sounds outrageous. Read the book. It'll work for you. Trust me. Between two dominant political figures, Roscoe Pike, who is racist, demagogic. He runs around the state and preaches to his choir of segregationists. He thinks he's going to win because he thinks he's going to carry rural Georgia because they fear civil rights. They fear the incursion of African Americans into their lives. He is opposed primarily by a candidate named Harrison Parker. Parker is the attorney general of the state of Georgia. And he is not an outspoken segregationist. One little fact about Georgia politics in 64, you couldn't be elected to statewide office in Georgia in 1964 unless at least people thought you were a segregationist. Fact of the matter. But for those politicians who might be a little more progressive, who might see the civil rights thing as something we've got to get through and get through peacefully and make concessions and hope it works out, fine. But how do you get elected to do that? It's not an uncommon problem for people who had progressive ideas. I should say moderate ideas. Progressive has a different meaning today than it did back then. Moderate ideas about how the state should be run back in those days. So Harrison Parker's dilemma is how do I, how do I pull votes away from this arch segregationist who's going around trying to wrap up the entire rural vote. I can't go out and say what I think. I can go right up to the edge, but I can't say it because if it does, it's sudden death for my campaign. There's an example I will use from actual Georgia history to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Jimmy Carter in 1970. Great gubernatorial campaign, by the way. One of the most more entertaining, interesting races I've ever covered. Jimmy Carter, when he was, he won the race. When he was inaugurated in 71, in his inaugural address, he said, I say to you quite frankly, the time for racial discrimination is over. There were a lot of very surprised people when they heard that because they never heard him say that during his campaign. And the reason he didn't say it during his campaign was he wouldn't have been elected if he had. So that gives you an idea. Uh, Harrison Parker's not Jimmy Carter. Uh, he's, he's different. But the challenge he faces is similar to what Jimmy Carter faced, getting the rural conservative vote. But you can't really compare the two races. Jimmy Carter was running against Carl Sanders, right? Carl Sanders, a New South governor. It was pretty easy to run the, to the right of Carl Sanders, which Carter very effectively did. Harrison Parker, my fictional character, has a much bigger challenge because he's running against a racist. Uh, who's avowed and outspoken and, and very colorful and charismatic in his own way. So Harrison Parker needs some help, and he gets it from the Atlanta power structure in the person of the owner of the largest bank in town, whose name is Devereaux Inman, which I think has a really nice Atlanta sound. It's a <laughs> Devereaux Inman, who is uh, going to back Harrison Parker, but not publicly. The last thing Harrison Parker needs is for anyone to think that the white Atlanta power structure is supporting his campaign. That would be death in the rural part of the state, and he needs those rural votes. Uh, but Devereaux Inman is coaching Harrison Parker on how to do it. He's funding his campaign. He's working out TV time for him. And back in those days, there wasn't a lot of TV time. You, time. you don't have these production spots that we have today. Uh, they were very basic, standing in front of a camera reading a cue card, not even a teleprompter. But any, in any event, uh, television was part of that, and, and Devereaux Inman is financing that in a very surreptitious way. Because Devereaux Inman, as I indicated earlier, was one of those wise, progressive leaders who felt we had to get through the civil rights movement without violence. And he sees the murder of Jarvis Pendry in Pickett County raised the possibility that violence there could spread to Atlanta, it could be a mess. So he is very invested in this governor's race and in seeing the city through this very trying time. And then you have the news media. And um, the, some say my alter ego, and I guess probably pretty close to being correct, is a young cameraman reporter 
And back in 64, TV cameramen were reporters, and reporters were cameramen. It was one man. Uh, Gil is out covering news. He's grown up in a suburban middle-class household. Parents, uh, not racist, but pretty happy with the status quo. Uh, Gil has no philosophical direction, but once he's in the position of covering these stories, he sees it. He sees the hatred, he sees the violence, he sees the courage, he sees all of it, and it changes him. It changes him. Not so much uh, from uh, a philosophical point of view, but from he is infused with the responsibility of telling it true, of taking these images and recording them and sending them out to the public, to the world, to the Atlanta audience and, and on out into TV land all over the country and, and the world, in fact. Uh, so he's a, a straight arrow and kind of a figure who continues through the book in a, in a very steady way. He has a, a companion who uh, accompanies him on a lot of these assignments uh, named Mindy Williams. She is an Associated Press reporter, uh, very petite, lovely, uh, talks with a soft southern accent, and she's tough as nails and courageous as they come. And she has this penchant for quoting lines of poetry at the most inopportune time. She's got a poetic line for everything. Uh, so that, that adds a little a quirkiness to the character of Mindy. And as you might suspect, the relationship between Gil and Mindy uh, grows interestingly, I hope, uh, as, as the book progresses. Uh, there's also an element of, of management of news organizations, particularly the television stations. Uh, back in those days, there was a huge responsibility on the news media, television and radio, to, yes, tell it true, but to put it in perspective. Because sensationalizing would have been so easy uh, to, to take a story and to twist it and to actually spark violence would have been so easy. The responsibility was to pull back from that, to try to keep everything in perspective. The visuals themselves were horrifying. I mean, they needed no commentary. I mean, think Bloody Sunday in Selma. You don't need commentary. You just see it happening, and you're stunned and shocked. A lot of the video from those days was that way. Uh, but it was incumbent upon the TV stations, the managers of those stations, the news directors, to be sure that everything was in perspective. Because, let's face it, they too were part and parcel of the effort to get this city through some violent, troublesome times and they did their job. And I mentioned Eugene Patterson and Ralph McGill. They were doing their job by editorializing very often the front page of the Atlanta Constitution or the Atlanta Journal, two papers back then, same ownership, uh, about progressive ways to get the city through these times. Uh, all of this was extremely valuable, I think, in the overall effort. I guess we call it the Atlanta Way. I don't think the Atlanta Way was a thing back then, but uh, certainly that was the origin of the Atlanta Way, uh, having everybody enlisted in the same cause to move the city forward. And it, it, it did work. It did work. So we, uh, we put all of these characters in play. We uh, have some thrilling moments in the book. I hope it'll be a page turner for you. That's another advantage of fiction. You can put your own dramatic points in there. And I have done that with abandon. But it is firmly rooted in what I covered, what I saw, what I experienced. It is real. And I hope that you will have that experience when you read the book. And I hope you will. And I hope you'll let me know what you think. Now, I want to open it up for questions, if we have any. And if we don't, I'll just keep talking. But uh, with, with an audience like this, I'm sure there are going to be some questions. H has anybody read the book here? Nobody's read the book good. So, well, so no plot spoilers, I promise. Do we have anyone that wants to kick it off with questions? Yes, ma'am. John, this is a personal question for you. Uh, as my friend, I think you won't mind. But as a young man, you began your career with a a job of filming a horrific event. And you were there behind the camera. How did you feel? And I'll tell you why I asked this question in a minute. While you were there and you saw things happening that were horrible, and uh, did you have the urge to do anything about that? Or 
And I, that's, that's I, an I excellent have a question. question because we see videos all the time now that people take with their phones and they're standing by terrible events and they're just videoing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious, knowing you as a person, uh, what it must well, have felt I, like. Well, I think you have to understand that the, the news media in, in 64 was so much different than today. Um, a much smaller group of people, very fewer sources for your news. Today, it's so much different. I mean, everybody has a, a cell phone. Everybody records video. You could, cover, you could cover a news story today with this. You could go out and shoot it, track it, feed it to the world. That's all you need. Back in the old days, you had a lot of equipment. It was bulky. And, and to be very honest with you, when you're recording something like that, and you're doing it as a professional, a reporter, you have to disengage from any inclination to get involved. Uh, there would be exceptions to that, of course. If you covered an, a wreck or something and somebody was needing life-saving attention, you would certainly do that, and, and that has been done in the past. But for something like this, first of all, there was nothing I could have done about that, those kids being beaten. Uh, it was my job to get the pictures. And, um, yeah, but you're right. Today, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you can't do anything without somebody taking a picture of it. And it, it makes the news very accessible, but also very untrustworthy, because you don't know what you're seeing. You don't know where it came from, what the motivations might be. And I will say with some pride that back in the 60s, um, we didn't have any of that. It, you, you, people actually tuned in to watch the news at 6. It wasn't 24-7 all the time, coming in on your phone or whatever. You gathered around the TV set at 6 o'clock to watch the news. And the news had more impact back then because people were watching very few actual outlets. Same with the newspapers. Um, and today, it's, there's a multiplicity of sources. I mean, how many different cable channels do you watch for your news? I mean, they're all over the place. Uh, not to mention the feeds on your iPhones or whatever. Uh, it's, it's perplexing. Uh, so, I, you know, I've often said we have the potential today to be the best informed society in the history of Earth, and yet I fear that we're the least well informed because you reach a point of who do you trust, you know, and, and question all the sources you see. It wasn't like that back in the 60s. So things have changed, not necessarily for the better. Although it's great to be able just to carry this out and not have to lug 1,800 pounds of equipment <laughs> to every story. Yes. Wait, who has Oh, here we go. Norman Underwood, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> One of the John, what happened to the fairness doctrine that, that uh, controlled TV and uh, broadcast journalism and uh, broadcast management in those years. Um, what, what happened to that doctrine, and uh, why, why do we not have it anymore? Well, it was done away with, uh, Norman. Um, and I'm not so sure that was a bad thing, because it was, for those of you who don't know, the Fairness Doctrine was an FCC-mandated rule that television news operations had to give equal time uh, to every opposing viewpoint. And that sounds great, but it's also government telling the media what they should be doing. I think the concept is, is, a, is a good one, but I always had a problem with governmental dictums on, in terms of what you should do to get your license every five years, which the FCC required. Uh, so the Fairness Doctrine is gone. And that you're right, that's opened up tremendously slanted news operations all over the, the dial. Uh, no matter what your political philosophy or leaning, you know, you're going to be watching something, and it, the chances are it's not going to be really objective. Uh, so the, the onus and the burden really is on you, the viewer, to make your choices wisely and to watch various outlets to see what the other side is saying. Uh, we become so siloed in terms of what we believe and we tend to watch only those outlets that reinforce our beliefs that that does in fact, I think, lead to a, a conflict in society. 
Uh, you know, maybe, the, maybe it's time to bring the Fairness Doctrine back, but I frankly don't think that's going to happen because of government, governmental interference. I would always be concerned about abuse of that, Norman, uh, but it's a good question. Yes. Oh, well, all right, you're next. Okay. Uh, John, when, I think when she introduced you, she made reference to the fact that this is your first book, which made me wonder if you might be working on another one. And if so, <laughs> and if so is it related to this well, book? Well, I am the world's oldest debut author. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it took a lot of work. It only took me 60 years to write this one. Uh, no, only kidding, about three, three years of really intense work. Uh, and I'm thinking about writing another one. Yes, I am. I, uh, I hired a publicist, somebody who helps me schedule all of these appearances. That was a good investment. But she says, John, you've got to be writing that book. And I said, how can I write a book? I'm making speeches all over the place. I have no time. She said, you need to be telling people you're writing a book. So yes, I'm writing a book. Uh, <laughs> I'm writing it up here. I'm not physically writing it. I have to check with my wife, Andrea, who's in the audience tonight. She... Uh, I think she got a little tired of sitting, you know, a couple of feet away from me reading the paper or something, and her husband's in a different world. And that's what happens when you write. It's, uh, has anyone here written fiction? It's, uh, it's a marvelous process once you get rolling, once you get your characters in place, once you have a story that seems to be clicking. Uh, something amazing happens, and writers of fiction will tell you this. Sometimes your characters, if they're well-drawn, will begin to tell you what the story's going to be. I know that sounds mystical, and it is mystical. Uh, Lucas McSwain, who is my sheriff, and my favorite character in the entire book, think uh, Carol O'Connor in, in The Heat of the Night. He's, you know, that's his, and you say, oh, stereotypical sheriff, right? No, no. He is faced with some choices, and the arc of his story, I can honestly tell you, he led me to. Um, it's, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but it truly happens. Your characters will begin to help you write the story. So um, to have that experience again, I think I would like maybe to, to try to write another book and see if I could duplicate that. Because Sheriff McSwain took me on quite a, an interesting journey. <laughs> you have to read the book to figure out what that is. Any other Who questions? Is, um, one yes. Of most memorable interviewees. Most memorable interview. Um, that would be a good one. I uh, I've interviewed quite a, a few folk along the way. Um, Ted Turner probably the most challenging interview because no matter what you ask him, he's going to throw it back in your face. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Carter, I interviewed him so many times and. Um, he, uh, his mind is, is so quick, and he is um, he, he was a stimulating man to interview. Uh, Carl Sanders, uh, one of my personal heroes. Uh, it was a privilege to interview Carl Sanders. Uh, here, here's a man who, I should, I should branch off and tell you another story here. Uh, I used to do a lot of speaking to high school and middle school students, and civil rights would sometimes come up because that was the most compelling story I was ever involved in. Not one particular story, but the whole mosaic of the civil rights movement. And it was just incredible to me that those students, black and white, had no conception of what life during segregation was like. They, they could not relate to it, which I think is a good thing, but I also think it's good that we should look back and, and see the way it was to see how far we've, we've come. Um, what was the point I was about to make? Uh, oh, Carl Sanders. <laughs> Carl Sanders uh, was a New South governor, but he was actually elected with people thinking he was a segregationist. This was 1962. But he was a progressive thinking man, and, and the power structure of the city the same power structure that aided and abetted Ivan Allen as our mayor, right man at the right time. And Carl Sanders was, was that kind of a, a future thinking governor. And to give you an example of what Carl Sanders did, and one reason he is my hero, 
1962, if you walked into the state capital of Georgia, the water fountains had white only, colored only on them, and the restrooms were white and colored. Leroy Johnson, who was the first African-American state senator elected since Reconstruction, had just come into office too. He had African-American interns, young Atlanta University students who were helping him. And he said, use the right restrooms, use the white water fountains. Don't, don't pay any attention to those colored signs. Well, some South Georgia legislators came to the governor and said, Governor, you know what's going on down there? He said, you got those boys are using the white water fountains. Sanders called Ben Fortsman, Fortson, the legendary Secretary of State, and said, take those signs down immediately. Overnight, the Georgia State Capitol, Capitol was desegregated. There was no press conference. There was no press release. Carl Sanders did it. And that was not the only thing he did. But he was a, a good man and a great leader, and uh, I mourn his, uh, his passing. Yes. You know, sort of in a related way, um, we're in 2022. Um, has anyone tried to judge your characters or these people who are undergoing dilemmas about how they're going to face up to segregation and progress? Have, has anyone tried to use 2022 standards against them, sort of in a presentism type way? Uh, not yet, but I fully expect that to happen. Uh, there are a number of challenges in writing, writing about 64, knowing that people are going to re be reading it in 2022. Uh, because I wanted it to be authentic. And I will tell you, it's not entirely authentic because I didn't want to use a certain word that would have been authentic. Uh, and it's not used until almost the very end, and that is in a court, court testimony where it's very relevant and is explained. But... Um, that sort of thing. If I had used that word, I would have been technically accurate and authentic. But as a good writer friend of mine said when he read my first draft, which had far too many of those expressions in it, he said, it's like a slap in the face every time you read that. And he was right. So I took it out. And there are probably other things in there. You know, purging, uh, purging historical fiction of anachronisms is, is a very difficult thing. One of the biggest challenges I had. I remember driving a big WSB Ford station wagon in 1964 with air conditioning. <laughs> and my publisher said, are you sure cars were air conditioned in 64? And I said, yeah, I remember. He said, are you sure? So I, so I went to Google. And uh, sure enough, uh, it was not a standard option in vehicles in 1964. It was in 1966. It was a factory option you could buy in 1964, but most people just rolled the windows down and you know, got sunburn on their arms as they were driving, driving around. So purging the anachronisms was a, was a huge uh, issue. But I'm sure someone will probably call me on some things in the book, but uh, I hope you will find it authentic if, if you should read it and uh, let me know if you, you think it's not. Hey, yes. Pop. Hi. Um, okay, I have two questions. Sure. That you can choose. I've got the like harder one and then the easier one. Well, let's <laughs> go with the harder one first okay. to <laughs> get that out of the way. So this is connected to the last question that was okay. asked. But, um, you know, obviously, I I find I grew up listening to your stories. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I've been reading the book, I love it. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, what have you learned while you're writing this story about injustices and discrimination that happened back through a time that you lived and you, you told true? Like, what, what other truths have come out to you in this process um, of, like, recollecting and 
and like fabricating, but in a good way, not like bad fabricating? That's really a good question, and it, it causes me to pause and, and think uh, because I was trying to, to, to give so many different points of view uh, of the people involved, what their thought process was. Even the killers of my character, Jarvis Pendry, who are, I mean, the best thing you can say about them is Southern Neanderthals. They are, they are people who are so frightened by the potential for black people actually coming and, and getting rights and, and shoving them off of their very low rung on the ladder they're afraid of that. They're afraid of it to the point that they would murder to keep it from happening. And of course, that only accelerates the process, which is one of the ironies of the resistance to civil rights. The, uh, the rougher the resistance, the quicker the progress. There's a line in the book from, from one of the northern journalists who's come down to cover this. He's talking to Gil in a, a tavern, which I, which I called... Uh, Marty's Tavern has a strange resemblance to another watering hole. But he makes a statement and said, you know, Timmons would, Reverend Timmons would much prefer to be face to face with an angry, screaming mob waving Confederate flags than a group of, you know, sophisticated people who oppose him. He, he needs that for the media. He needs that to send his message out. Um, I'm not answering your question directly. Uh, because I'm not sure how to do it. I can say that in writing about this period, it brought back a lot of memories. Um, did it change me? No. It was therapeutic to bring it out, uh, to talk about the motivations of all the characters. Even in that same Marty's Tavern sequence, you may recall if you've gotten that far, they talk about where are the good white Southerners? Where are they? Well, we know they're out there, but where are they? Nobody's speaking up. Why aren't they speaking up? Well, they, they can't speak up because they might get fired. They might get hassled at work. Their kids might be ostracized at school. They might get kicked out of the you know, weekly bridge game. So they, they don't say anything. And you know, Dr. King, what was it in his letter from the Birmingham jail, said, you know, those who don't speak up or just as guilty as those who actually commit the acts. So I, I guess, in a way, answering your question, it was a revelation to keep delving into that. And again, the characters helped me, too, with this. I know it sounds strange, but the characters actually had ideas that came to me, and then I gave them voice on the printed page. So that was a tough question. I'm not sure I thoroughly answered it. Do you, ha you have an easier one for me? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, like I said before, I grew up listening to your stories. I mean, you are a storyteller at heart. And um, it's always, you know, looking at you, I, you're Pop and then you're John Pruitt. But you're also John Pruitt when you're Pop. Um, <laughs> this is my granddaughter, in yes, case anyone <laughs> is wondering, who flew in from Denison University in Ohio to be with me tonight. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ansley. Um, and, and, but there's, it's, it's just so interesting because you, you're John Pruitt when you're Pop, but you're not Pop when you're John Pruitt. And I'm, I'm really interested to know where you think the line is, but, because also with this book, you're a journalist. You were a journalist, and you told the truth, and you, you told real stories, and this book is based off of real stories, but it is fiction. Um, but it definitely has the same, it rings true still, um, even though it's false. And like, where do you draw the line between what is um, like a true journalist portrayal of truth and, and telling a story? Well, Ansley, thank you. Uh, fiction is, is making stuff up. I mean, really, it is. And for good historical fiction, you make stuff up, but you do it within a framework of, of actuality. True to the time, true to the, the characters, what they were thinking, all of that, uh, that restrains you. So you can't take flights of fancy too far. I mean, you could, 
But for legitimate historical fiction, I don't think you should. You should be fairly tightly reined in. So my hope would be anyone reading this book would not think anything couldn't have happened because it all could have happened, and some of it did happen. But, you know, reading is in the eye of the, uh, the reader, so they will have to make their own judgment. Yes. Sort of off the topic of your book, um, two questions. Where are we supposed to go for the news we can believe, to, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on? And do you miss your 6 o'clock news anchor position? <laughs> You know, I don't miss the news at all. Uh, I don't miss being on the news. I never did. Uh, it was time to go, and I was happy to go. Uh, happy to have holidays off and not have to worry about the midnight phone call about a plane crash in North Georgia. Uh, so, no, I haven't. I miss the people. There's a, something about a newsroom that is exciting. Uh, you walk into a newsroom in the middle of the afternoon and people are busy. They're working on that 5 o'clock show or the 6 o'clock show. They're talented, driven. They're writing. They're calling out police signals. I mean, the whole thing is just terribly exciting. And I enjoyed that, and I do miss that uh, and the people involved. As to, as to where you go for your, your news, I, that's a question I cannot answer. That's a question that each of you must answer individually. My encouragement would be to sample a wide variety of sources, uh, television and written sources. I think you need a, a composite of all of that. Uh, I read a couple of newspapers every morning, uh, and I don't really watch much TV in the morning, but occasionally I will. This morning I did. I wanted to see how the, <laughs> the Warnock uh, Walker race turned out. Uh, but it's tough to answer. Uh, the only thing I would definitely say is don't watch the same thing all the time, particularly if it's feeding you back what you already think. I mean, I think you need to challenge yourselves intellectually in terms of what might be out there. Uh, so if you watch Fox, it wouldn't hurt you to read the Washington Post every now and then or to watch M MSNBC. It wouldn't hurt you at all. You always go back to Fox or vice versa. If you're an a inveterate MSNBC watcher, you know, check out the conservative channels as well. Uh, it's only in that way that you can determine what you really trust over a period of time. But it really is up to each individual person. I don't want to overstay my time, Claire. You're going to give me the high sign, right? Yes, oh, and one more. more. Yes. I'm actually going to go to the uh, lady who didn't get to ask a question yet. Sorry. Claire, you're doing a wonderful job of <laughs> working the room for me. Uh, you have such a lovely and distinctive voice. Is an audio book, I don't think it's available. Is that, will that be available? <laughs> I am actually looking into that. Uh, Mercer Press does not do, and that's my publisher, and I, I, they're great, they're terrific. Uh, they do not do audio books, but that's something I will probably have to, to engineer. And you should, uh, yes, I'm sure, thinking about that, sure. and uh, that's part of the plan. The book has actually only been out since the 4th of October, so it's still making its way into the hearts and minds of readers <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> at least I hope. It actually is doing pretty well, guys. I mean, I, I'm happy to say. But um, yes, audio. audio is coming. I think that's very important. A lot of people like to listen to books. My daughter, Christina, among them, and uh, so do I, in fact. So uh, that's, that's definitely on the ticket. We're just going to do our last question this evening. I now have two comments. I love audiobooks. I grew up with a father who read to me all the time, even when I was in my teens. And so I think that's one reason I love listening. So mm -hmm. I'm waiting for yours because okay. I know your voice and I want to hear it. <laughs> but don't I've got a lot of accents I'm going to have to master, you know. <laughs> Well, that will be hard. Yeah. I'm concerned. I mean, I'm questioning the status of what we would call journalism today. I read the local paper, and I read another uh, New York paper. But in our paper, we seem, it seemed to me that uh, journalists were to be neutral. Editorializing was not 
what you do when you're writing a news story. But I see so many modifiers and adjectives that slide in to the writing that color the story in a way that uh, it's very subtle, but you certainly know it when you're trained to look for that kind of thing. And I always was as a teacher, you know, to help children to realize what they were doing. So I'm just wondering, um, is that a now allowed in journalism or is that just an error? I think the standards are not what they used to be in terms of maintaining strict objectivity, in terms of what's presented either in writing or on television. Um, but there's always been slanted journalism. There's always been opinionated journalism. Uh, and it will always be with us. Well, yeah, editorials are one thing, and straight news coverage is another. And I'm with you. Uh, when I watch a newscast, I want it to be objective. I don't want adjectives that could be pejorative or influence your ideas one way or the other. Uh, some people say that's dull. That's OK with me. Uh, I'd prefer it to be objective. But I, I don't think the standards are as rigorous as they were back in the day, shall we say. Uh, thank, thank you all for your attention. I've really enjoyed being with you. And I hope you'll read Tell It True. <laughs> thank you so much to John for speaking with us this evening. I told him that our crowds are never shy. So thank you for all of your really wonderful we're great. questions. You were great. Uh, we will meet you out in the lobby for a book signing after this. If you're looking for more author events, our next one is on Monday. It's a World War II history book by Bob Drury. We hope to see you there. Thanks again.